<laughs> My name is Clark Murdoch. I'm a senior advisor here at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. My speaking part in tonight's event will be soon over. Um, I direct the project on nuclear issues. This is our first event of Pony Debates the Issues that we've held during this academic year of 2010-2011. Uh, you all have information that has a brief bio for both of our debaters today, and it will be moderated by Kevin Kallmeyer, who is a uh, former debater himself during this time and continues a tradition of uh, coming out of the Taylor Debate Intern Program uh, and fostering uh, debate. I participated in the first debate, and I can tell you participating in a debate on an issue is quite different than making a presentation at a panel, uh, as you'll find out. Kevin will go through the ground rules for the debate, and then we'll begin. Thank you all for attending. Hi. Uh, I just wanted to thank everyone for coming, for taking your uh, Tuesday night and spending it here to talk about the New START Treaty. Uh, I'm just going to serve as moderator, and that just means that I'm going to make sure that they are the focus of this and that it gets moving along. I'd like to thank both of them, Paula de Sutter and Mort Halperin, for coming, Pony for putting this on, and CSIS for hosting. The format is modified from a traditional college debate uh, format. We're going to be debating the question, should the United States Congress ratify the new start? Uh, and answering that question in the negative will be Paula de Sutter, uh, and Mort Halpern will be answering in the affirmative. We're going to begin with opening remarks, which will be 10 minutes, uh, followed by an extended question period, uh, where the debaters will ask each other questions. I will ask questions as a moderator, and then there will be an extended floor Q&A period. The debate's going to finish with closing statements from each of the debaters, and then we'll be on our way. Uh, I would like everyone to give Paula DeSutter a big hand uh, for starting this debate off. Thank you so much. I, um, I like I, all human beings relish the opportunity to speak in public, especially in a debate forum with somebody very smart who can attack me and eat me up for for lunch. So, thank you very much for having me. I oppose the New START Treaty. Um, I, I suppose in theory down the road I could be persuaded otherwise, but I doubt it. I especially oppose the passage of the New START Treaty in the lame duck session. I'll tell you the three reasons why I oppose uh, ratification of New START. First, I think that the treaty is extremely flawed. And I think that many of these, these flaws are exemplified by the, the articles in the resolution of ratification. Second, I think that while the Republican senators who have had critiques of New START have been attributed with the argument that it's just politics as usual, I think the resolution of ratification, which was supported by all Democratic members of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, validates the concerns that were raised by Republicans and by other critics. And I think that the, Repu the Russian Federation response to the resolution of ratification reinforces the point that those critiques were valid. My, uh, I served for many years as the Assistant Secretary for Verification and Compliance at the State Department. So you will not be surprised to discover that, for me, among the most significant flaws in the New START Treaty is its lack of effective verification. This lack of effective verification is evidenced by Senator Bond, who is the Vice Chairman of the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence, his opposition to ratification of the New START Treaty and his floor statement of November 18th. I'm very concerned that the administration's rebuttal to Senator Bond contains what, for me, are blatant falsehoods. And I think those exemplify what critics believe are, are overselling points for New START. So, let me start with the first one. 
New Start's flawed. Let's go to the Senate resolution of ratification. I think you can, um, there are all of the Democratic members of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee voted for the Senate resolution of ratification. There would be, if it goes to the floor, there will be additional amendments, I assume. Only three Republican members voted for it, and five opposed passing the resolution of ratification and submitted uh, minority views. All of those, as you probably know, can be found in the executive report issued out of the, the Foreign Relations Committee. The concerns about START in the resolution of ratification are serious ones, as are those in the minority views. There are 10 conditions, three understandings, and 13 declarations. The senators' concerns can be addressed, uh, the, the concerns they address can be categorized into four groups. First, Contrary to the administration's position that no Russian violation would be militarily significant because the U.S. would merely increase the alert status of our forces, the Senate expressed concern regarding U.S. ability to monitor Russian compliance and detect noncompliance or breakout, as well as expressing the importance of strict Russian compliance. The Senate addressed the need for U.S. modernization of its nuclear forces and delivery systems and the importance of maintenance of, an, of a robust U.S. nuclear triad. Third, the Senate expressed its concerns about the U.S. right to expand its U.S. missile defenses and rejected further limits, including any negotiated in the bilateral consultative commission created under New START. To some degree, that's minimized because you, you have to, they, what they say is you have to bring it to the Senate for advice and consent. And finally, they raise concerns in numerous places about the U.S. right to deploy conventional strategic systems without them counting against the new start limits. While the effort that members took to address many of the concerns that we've expressed, those of us who are critics, about New START are commendable, they fell short of turning this sow's ear into a silk purse. I think that rather than a silk purse, you could characterize New START as a burlap bag with great big holes in it. And those of us who are opposed to the treaty believe that a burlap bag with holes is not a good enough tool for carrying U.S. national security. Now, Many in the administration and many supporters of New START have said, look, the critics' concerns are unfounded. There's really no basis for it. There's no limit on missile defense. There's no limit on conventional strike. However, on October 29th, as reported in Moscow's Interfax news agency, the head of the Russian State Duma International Affairs Committee said that based on the SFRC resolution of ratification, the Russian Federation would have to reconsider ratification. He specifically identified three conditions in the resolution of ratification that he and the military found unacceptable. First, it is, I'm quoting, it is especially emphasized that it is U.S. Senators' understanding that strategic range non-nuclear weapon systems do not fall under the treaty. The second understanding presumes that the Americans are trying to apply the New START Treaty to rail mobile ICBMs in case they are built. And third, they say at the same time that the New START Treaty will on no account limit the Pentagon's efforts toward deploying missile defenses. Now, let me remind you that those are all very strong critiques. Those, those issues are critiques that Republicans and opponents of START have levied at this agreement and which have been waved aside. Those aren't valid concerns. And yet the Russian Federation says there's ambiguity about that, we disagree with it, we may have to reconsider. Now let me turn to the lack of effective verification. Senator Bond, after some of us who have been out there kind of by ourselves raising questions about verification spoke on the floor on November 18th about the lack of effective verification of the START Treaty. 
one of the things the senator said, and I'm going to read you some quotes. The Select Committee on Intelligence has been looking at this issue closely over the past several months. As the vice chairman of this committee, I, I don't know if you all know this, but unlike most committees, you don't have a chairman and ranking member. On Senate Intel, you have a chairman and vice chairman. It's a, it's a much higher, okay, maybe not much higher, it's a higher level of responsibility. As the vice chairman of this committee, I've reviewed the key intelligence on our ability to monitor this treaty and heard from our intelligence professionals. There is no doubt in my mind that the United States cannot reliably verify the treaty's 1550 limit on deployed warheads. As an initial hurdle, the 10 annual warhead inspections allowed under the treaty permit us to sample only 2 to 3 percent of the total Russian force. Further, under New START, unlike its predecessor, any given missile can have any number of warheads loaded on it. So even if the Russians fully cooperated in every inspection, these inspections cannot provide conclusive evidence of whether the Russians are complying with the warhead limit. Let us take an example. Say the United States found the missile was loaded with more warheads than the Russians declared. Now, the Russian declaration isn't an annual declaration. It's a declaration when you show up at the base. And if they move missiles around, all those change between then and the next one. While this would be a faulty and suspicious declaration by Russia, we could not necessarily infer from it that they had violated the 1550 warhead limit, especially because the Russians could always make some excuse for faulty declarations. I totally and completely agree with that. And so, where are we on time? Ooh, <laughs> new tech. <laughs> and so I think that, that all of these are, are very serious flaws. I think that um, this is a personal view. The, the hearings that were held in the Foreign Relations Committee at least, I can't really speak to the Armed Services Committee as well, or Intel, were, were flawed in that only a couple of the many witnesses that were called before the Foreign Relations Committee were opponents or critics of New START. I, I don't know that you could call Bob Joseph and Eric Edelman opponents, but at least those who raised concerns. And so I think that um, this is a treaty whose time has not yet come. I think an effort to jam this through in the lame duck session to get it through by the end of December would be a mistake. I think it would ill serve the American public because I think we need to have a little bit more debate about this. Um, it, you can argue that that the Russians pose a threat. You can argue that the Russians don't pose a threat. You can argue that we need modernization or don't. But in, in any case, there needs to be more debate on the Senate. The Senate debate on the floor, should it come up, needs to be extensive and, in my view, needs to include um, an understanding on the part of members of certain things, including the classified letter written by Senator Bond, which Senator Bond has said is available in the Senate Security Office, as well as the, the negotiating record, which has been made available in limited circumstances to, to members. And so with that, I'll stop my opening remarks. With points of sand left, Thank you very much. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. I suspect my opponent ran out of things to say against the treaty, which is why she stopped uh, a, a, little bit, a little bit early. But, I'd, I'd be happy to, to, to continue but, uh, for a while. Uh, there are many things to say about the treaty, so I may use her last few seconds of, of her time. I think <clears throat> we need to start by asking the question, of what advances the national security interests of the United States. And in particular, we need to ask 
is the world with the treaty ratified one in which the United States can more effectively advance and protect its security interests than the world without the treaty? Because the third world, this magic world in which we have somehow a treaty which is better in some ways, uh, different in some ways, has some of the old inspection procedures in it, is not a viable option. Uh, the President of the United States gets to negotiate treaties. The question for the Senate is whether to give its advice and consent to ratification. And I would argue that the Senate should give its advice and consent to ratification. I think the process that has gone on so far cannot be called rushed. Uh, I think if the Senate was able to debate this treaty for a week or two before it adjourned, that that would be a full and ample time consistent with the amounts of time that the Senate has devoted uh, to previous treaties, uh, and that we need to decide the issue on the merits and not on the, on the allegation that somehow, because we're doing it sooner than some people want, the treaty is being rushed. I see nothing about the process that is rushed. Nor, as I say, do I think we can decide whether we're for ratification of this treaty simply by looking at uh, the question of whether it is fully and completely verifiable, whether there are limits that we would like to have that aren't in it, or that there are some constraints in it that, that we would not want to have. Rather, I think we have to ask the question, how does the world with this treaty advance the security interests of the United States as compared to a world without this treaty? Uh, and I think it is worth noting that the people who get paid to make these judgments, the professionals who get paid to make these judgments in the American government, the career military officers and the senior civilian officials of the Defense Department, are in unanimous agreement uh, that this treaty advances the security interests of the United States. Uh, <clears throat> when the military are not for a treaty, they will tell you that. And I think we have to take them at their word that this treaty, in fact, advances our security interests. And indeed, nothing that I've heard so far this evening really even goes to that question of will we be better off with this treaty uh, than, than without this treaty. Even if you take everything as true that was said, which I do not, I would still argue that this treaty is in our interest. This treaty provides uh, an ability for the United States to have much greater confidence in how big the Russian force will be uh, and how it will be deployed than it would be without this treaty. It enables us to make modest reductions in our own strategic forces um, and with, with confidence that the Russians will follow suit and that we will not have an asymmetric situation in our strategic forces. It also contributes to improving our relations with Russia, and as the administration has testified, increases the likelihood of Russian cooperation on the real serious nuclear threats that we face of North Korea, of Iran, of dispersal of nuclear weapons to terrorist groups and organizations. Those are the threats that are most likely to occur, and those are the threats for which we need the cooperation of Russia, which does not mean we should sign an agreement with them that is not in our interest, but it means it is in our interest to seek to do what we have done, which is to negotiate an agreement with them uh, and then uh, to move forward to the ratification of that agreement. Uh, now, we're told that the, uh, that the treaty is, quote, not effectively verified. And I think we have to ask the question, how do you decide whether a treaty and the limits in a treaty are in the American interest in relation to verification? The question cannot be, are we sure that we will have 100 percent confidence that we would detect the first instance of Russian cheating? The question has to be, uh, taking account the limits and the value of those limits to the United States and the possibility of some degree of Russian cheating, is it in our interest to have the limit in the treaty uh, as opposed to not constraining uh, the Russian military forces? Uh, the Senate Foreign Relations Committee report suggests that 
our notion of what is acceptable verification goes back to the Reagan administration. In fact, it goes back substantially further than that. It goes back to the debates that began this process of arms control negotiations. It goes back to the debates in the Pentagon in the late 1960s. Because the last time the Joint Chiefs of Staff held the view that a limit was not acceptable unless it could be 100 percent verified was in 1968. At that point, the administration was planning to put forward a proposal to the Russians, to the Soviet Union then, as it was, to ban the further production of any ballistic missiles or, or submarines. And the American position was, the Joint Chiefs position then was, we can only include things in the agreement if we could be absolutely certain that there could be no Russian cheating. And so a Navy officer came to me one day and said, well, we can't include submarines in the agreement. And I said, well, why is that? And he said, because the CIA has just come out with its estimate that says that the Russians could cheat on an agreement prohibiting them from building any new ballistic missile submarines. And I said, well, what does it say? It says, yeah. he said, it says the Russians could build as many as three submarines and we wouldn't detect it, that only if they build a fourth submarine uh, would we have very high confidence of detection. And I said, well, how many submarines do we have now? And he said, 41. And I said, how many submarines are we planning to have 10 years from now? He said, 41. I said, how many submarines do the Russians have now? He said, I think one. And I said, how many do we think they will have 10 years from now? He said, 50. And I said, so you prefer a world in which we do not limit this and the Russians have 50 submarines and we have 40 to a world in which we have 41 and the Russians have three until we can be sure of detecting the fourth submarine. He said, that's right. The principle is you don't include something in the agreement uh, unless it could be 100 percent verified. And I looked at him and I said, I think I'm going to win this fight. Uh, and in fact, I did. Uh, and the Joint Chiefs changed their position then to what is clearly the correct position, which is that you ask yourself about each limit, including the warhead limit in this treaty. Uh, is it in our interest to have this limit, recognizing that there obviously could be some amount of Russian cheating? The question is, how much Russian cheating could there be before we detect it? And the question is, what is the strategic significance of that Russian cheating? We have seen no such analysis because no such analysis that could be presented that would be the slightest bit persuasive. The fact is that the margin of deterrence that we have of our ability to deter a Russian attack is so great that the margin of cheating that the Russians could possibly do is simply insignificant to the security interests of the United States. And so I think this treaty is, in fact, adequately verified. I think it is in our interest for the reasons that I've suggested. Um, and that uh, we should expect, as we always have in these treaties with the Russians, disagreements about precisely what provisions make. That's why we have a provision in the treaty for a negotiating body to settle disputes. Uh, we should not be surprised that the Russian rhetoric is different than our rhetoric. None of that goes to the heart of the treaty, which is uh, appropriately verified, effectively verified limits on warheads and missiles, which give us greater confidence that we will know what the Russians are doing, greater confidence that we will be able to reduce our forces while maintaining an effective deterrent, and will enable us to move forward with the Russians to deal with the real nuclear threats which we face from rogue states and from uh, potential uh, terrorist organizations. Thank you. We're now going to shift to uh, the cross-examination period, uh, where Paula de Sutter will have three questions for Mort Halperin, and then vice versa. Now, do I ask them all three at once? Uh, you can ask them one at a time if you'd like. Okay. Or By the way, it was somewhat unkind of Mr. Halperin to finish that much early when I finished early for the first time in my entire life. <laughs> but I, I'll try to put petty personal problems aside. Um, my first question for Mr. Halperin is to, to seek to elicit from him 
a discussion of the, the Constitution's requirement that a supermajority of 67 votes be required by the Constitution for giving advice and consent to treaties, and why you agree that the Constitution requires that supermajority to ensure confidence that members' concerns as reflecting America's concerns are adequately addressed. Well, as I understand the history, the provision is in the treaty uh, to prevent the abolition of slavery, is in the Constitution to prevent the abolition of slavery. So it's not, it does not have a notab notable origin. Uh, I think it probably doesn't make sense, and I would not be at all unhappy to have us debate a constitutional amendment uh, which provided for some lesser majority uh, to, to ratify treaties. But that's what the treaty has now, and therefore that's the vote we need uh, to move forward. But I think that there are 67 votes in the Senate now for ratification of the treaty uh, if the treaty uh, is brought up for a vote. Uh, and if members agree that there has been adequate debate and it's time for an up and down uh, vote on the treaty. So I'm not sure I understand what the question is. That's all right. I think you, you answered it far more fully than I would have expected. Um, second, in the absence of new start, let's say not only do we not do this during the lame duck, but we never do it ever, what strategic nuclear threat do you envision Russia posing to the United States? And what political retaliation do you fear from Russia if we don't uh, ratify the treaty? Well, I think retaliation is the wrong word. I think, as the administration has said, we have had much greater cooperation from Russia in dealing with other nuclear problems, with Iran, uh, with North Korea, and with the question of how to deal with uh, so-called goose nukes and keep them from getting into the hands of terrorists. Uh, that we have had that cooperation because we have dealt with the Russians in a straightforward way in terms of renewing the kind of nuclear arms control agreement that they wanted to have with us in terms of an agreement that was legally enforceable, that was verifiable, uh, and uh, that uh, is in the interests of both of both countries. And I think that uh, we run some risk that if we do not ratify this treaty that we will get less cooperation on the things that are important to us. I'm sorry, you had a first part of the question, which I... No, I think it was just what, if there's no start, is Russia going to pose a strategic nuclear threat? Oh, right. I, I think, uh, I think not. Uh, I think our ability to deter a Russian nuclear attack is very great with or without the treaty. Uh, I think there are great margins of safety that we have in the size force that we have and its ability to survive a Russian attack. But I do believe that we will have more confidence in our ability to do that, that we will be able to do that at less cost and at lower levels if the treaty is ratified than if it is not ratified. Thank you. Finally, are there any flaws or conditions in the international environment or with regard to Russia that would lead you to oppose ratification of this treaty or indeed any treaty with Russia? And if so, what are they? Well, I think you have to take the treaty on its merits. And uh, I do not believe we should trust the Russians to violate to observe agreements. I think we need to have verification measures, both unilateral measures and agreements not to interfere with unilateral measures, which I think is one of the important elements in this treaty. Um, but that we also have to maintain uh, effective forces uh, to deal with, uh, to deal with, uh, to deal with whatever the threat may be. Uh, I do not believe that one's conclusions about how evil another regime may be should lead us to be not interested in negotiating agreements that are in our security interests. The whole point of arms control was to say that agreements between potential adversaries, countries that had conflicting interests, that did not trust each other, could be in the interests of both countries by reducing the likelihood of a conflict that neither side 
wanted. And Ronald Reagan uh, knew that the Soviet Union was an evil empire, and he knew that getting rid of nuclear weapons was a good thing, and he knew that arms control agreements that you could verify were in the interests of the United States. And I think all those propositions are correct. Yeah, I'd like to uh, read a quote to you and ask you whether you were um, misquoted. Um, oh, no. no. Um, in the post-Cold War area, many provisions of the 1991 START Accord, which mandated deep nuclear weapons cuts, quote, are no longer necessary. We don't believe we're in a place where we need to have the detailed lists of weapons and verification measures, which is what you said in explaining why the administration was seeking a treaty which had no verification provisions in it. Were you misquoted? Have you changed your mind? Or is Could you read some the date of the interview? Uh, the interview is May 2007. I remember it oh so fondly. Um, well, one of the one of the things that is certainly true, and I think that Mr. Halperin asks a valid question, which is how would you compare verification of New Start against where you were at during your lead of negotiations with Russia on these same issues? And uh, let me let me tell you that um, the answer has to do with being in Washington far too long. And it is certainly true that the proposal that we had with Russia for a post-start agreement was not going to be effectively verifiable. And I knew that. Um, I had been handed, these are the transparency measures that you are permitted to pursue. There was one issue that was left open, and I fought for a year to ensure that we had uh, the capability to move the telemetry protocol into the, the post-start agreement. But no, we were not pursuing something that was effectively verifiable. Now, why would I, as the Assistant Secretary for Verification and Compliance for seven or eight years, be willing to do that? One of the things that I knew with certitude was that when I took that agreement up to the Hill, the, my, the, the people on the Foreign Relations Committee, both on the Republican side and the Democratic side, would have said, Paula, get yourself back to the negotiating table and get more verification. I knew that. What has not happened in this instance is that the Foreign Relations Committee did not send my successor back to the negotiating treaty to do a better job. Um, so it, it is fair. Now, the other thing that I would say is that we were pursuing a Moscow Treaty approach where we were going to acknowledge that we were not going to be able to achieve effective verification. I am, um, the, the start counting rules, the attribution limits that we had in the start treaty are an imperfect approach. What it means is that you have, let's say you have um, five different types of missiles. You know that each, how many flight tests have been performed for each of those missiles, how many warheads each of those missiles is capable of carrying. And so what you say is, we will attribute to you this number of warheads. Now, for the United States, that did indeed mean that we were going to be attributed with more warheads than we actually possessed in our inventory. But what it meant for verification is that when in the, the start verification regime, we went and performed a reentry vehicle on-site inspection, which bear with me now, I will always refer in the rest of this night to RVOSI. When we went to do an RVOSI with Russia, in many cases we couldn't verify, we addressed a lot of those issues, we created the same approach that this administration is now saying is a brand new approach, 
But if we found that the Russian missile that we were inspecting had one more or two more or five more reentry vehicles than what that missile was attributed as being able to carry, that was a major violation. It meant that those attribution rules, those counting rules, had been invalidated. It meant that there was a question about not only that missile, but all Russian missiles of that type. What the New START Treaty does is it erases all that. And it says, oh, we have this brand new thing. We're going to count every reentry vehicle on every missile. It's not true. In a given year, they're going to count 2 to 3 percent. And if they go to a Russian missile, which they have been handed a piece of paper when they got to the facility that says, you know, here's how many warheads on these missiles, and they pick a missile, and there are more reentry vehicles than, let's say, it was supposed to have three and it had ten, it doesn't tell you anything about any other Russian missile. Now, it is certainly true. There is no perfect verification. It, verification is by its nature something where you and another sovereign nation are engaged in an agreement and you are trying to find out something about their strategic ballistic missiles, their reentry vehicles, I mean sensitive national security stuff. For the United States, a treaty is the supreme law of the land. There are rules and procedures, and while we would include in some of our reports, called the Pell Reports, you know, what's going on with U.S. compliance, I didn't worry about it that much, because if the United States was violating an arms <coughs> control agreement, people from the Pentagon could go to jail. That's not necessarily true of other countries. So. The provisions in New START are not, even those that are, you know, attributed as being brand new and very good, are not all that good. Those things that we were pursuing in the Bush administration um, were not, we were not pursuing effective verification. But let me tell you that one of the things that we did have was the ban on encryption and the provision in the, the encryption protocol for all telemetry and telemetry data to be shared. This administration gave it up. Telemetry is the technical data that uh, those conducting a missile test um, perform and, and broadcast or collect and dump on their missiles so they know. It's missile engineer stuff. Um, they gave it up. They were not pursuing the same level of verification. Long answer. Long answer. Well, uh, I, I won't ask you as my second question whether you also said in that interview that verification provisions like on-site inspections have not always worked out well with Russians, sometimes hiding weapons from U.S. view. Verification is highly intrusive and expensive, but you're never going to know how many warheads they're going to have on various missiles. So the limits that you were counting on were ones that were going to expire, and you had said you didn't need any, any new ones. Um, I want, but I want to ask you about modernization, because I'm pleased to see that Republicans have suddenly uh, found an interest in the modernization of the nuclear arsenal. Uh, and I want to ask you two questions about that. One, would you? The Kiss Count is one. It's a because it's a subject matter. But you get to answer at length, so I wouldn't object. Um, would you prefer the Bush administration's plan for the modernization of the nuclear infrastructure, or the Obama administration's plan for the modernization of the nuclear infrastructure? And second, do you think the requirements to modernize the nuclear infrastructure are greater or less if the Senate fails to ratify? Uh, the Star Treaty. Mr.
Mr. Halperin has been in D.C. for a long time, and one of the things that he knows is that after a while, you develop a very quirky sense of humor. And I came with one, actually. Did you? <laughs> I might have two, but then I was coming from California, and you know, everybody out here thinks we're quirky. One of um, my favorite things in the entire start record, new start record, the testimonies, the debates, all that, was um, a question. It was the, the, one of the first hearings, and it was Senator Clinton, no, I'm sorry, Secretary Clinton, Gates, and um, the chairman. And one of the members asked Secretary Gates, you know, what do you think about the, you know, this you know, requirement that Republicans are pushing to modernize the nuclear infrastructure. And okay, it is true. I sat at my computer and laughed until I cried. Secretary Gates said, I've been the secretary for years now and I've been trying to get this done and it took an arms control agreement. And I thought, you know, it's a strange town. I am not going to sit up here and say that we in the Bush administration, I mean, it wasn't exactly something I was getting paid for, but I'm not going to say that we did half enough, a third as much, a, 20, a 20th as much as what needed to be done to modernize our nuclear infrastructure. We did not. The problem that the senators are trying to address in terms of nuclear infrastructure and nuclear modernization is a problem that has been growing for well over a decade. And so, I wouldn't say whether I support the Bush plan or the Obama plan. I think I would probably support the Kyle plan. Um, I think that the requirements for nuclear modernization are significant with and without New START. I think, and, and that's why some of us read Obama administration statements as saying, look, we'll give Senator Kyle this much for nuclear modernization if we can get advice and consent for a new start by the end of the year. But if you guys aren't going to do it by the end of the year, all bets are off. Either they believe it and they understand that we need this nuclear modernization or they don't. And I think that it is um, it is rather a good thing that, that this debate is happening because I think that this is nuclear modernization that we really need. I think our systems are antiquated, our infrastructure is antiquated, um, and I do believe that an infrastructure and, and nuclear warheads designed for the Cold War need to be modernized uh, designed, tested, in order to help the United States best deter, best respond to the threats that we're facing as we, we go into this, this very dangerous period we're in. One more. <clears throat> you suggested that the, that the administration had engaged in a number of falsehoods in defending the treaty. Would you pick the one you think is most serious and explain what you think was false about the administration's statement? Well, that was sort of a low softball, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Um, I think um, the administration has said that they are going to count every nuclear warhead on Russian missiles. Um, and they've indicated, they're not that clear, that the, um, the reentry vehicle on-site inspection provisions are new. They're not new. 
Um, one of the things when I started at the State Department in 2002 was I said the Russians have been violating the RVOSI prov provisions for years. What are we going to do about it? And there were some adjustments that were made. A am I thoroughly happy with them? No. Um, but they were somewhat better. The only thing I can try to figure out that the Obama administration is saying they are doing new on reentry vehicle on-site inspections is to have, to let the U.S. side look at the covers that they use. Um, let's see, an example. I, I would put this upside down, but I still got stuff in it. I have this, I put it over um, a reentry vehicle, and it does not permit you to know with certainty how many RVs are on a particular post boost vehicle. We now get to look inside them. I, I think that that's the only difference. Um, I've not been able to detect any others. And so when they say that they're going to count every reentry vehicle for all of the Russian missiles, it is not true. It's a 10 year treaty. You get two to three percent per year with the 10 inspections per year. Assuming that you use all 10 of those inspections for reentry vehicle on site inspections, you are not going to count every reentry vehicle, especially since any reentry vehicle that you inspect is not going to tell you anything about the rest of the inventory. Whether that inventory is another missile of that type, different missiles, uh, missiles of the same type. Let's say I'll use SS 18s, okay? You could have an SS-18 with one, you could have an SS-18 with eight, you could have one with 10, you could have one with 14. So if I do an inspection and this reentry, this missile has one reentry vehicle, what does that tell me about how to count the others? Nothing. If it has eight, nothing. 10, nothing. 14, nothing. So the reentry vehicle on-site inspections don't give me a, a global insight into the number of their missiles. Moreover, the only missiles I'm going to get to inspect are those that are the deployed missiles at declared bases. They're allowed to have non-deployed mobile missiles. So, and they can flight test their ballistic missiles with as many reentry vehicles as they want. Let's take the SS-18. Let's say I am, you know, I test it with, okay, this is not a real case example because I don't think we've ever known this, but I'm just trying to do it because I'm a poor math major. Okay, let's say I flight test an SS-18 with 20 RVs. But the only number I find on an RV OSI is eight. What does that tell me about whether they're meeting the 1550 limit? Nothing. But what it does tell me is that any SS-18s that are non-deployed, not limited by this treaty, and this is especially important when it comes to mobile missiles, those missiles could have as many RVs in deployment as they want. That's a breakout capability. That breakout capability could happen with a nanosecond of US knowledge that it's happening. You're not gonna get that kind of early warning and the only option the administration has talked about for what we're gonna do about that is that, well, we'll put all of our strategic missiles on higher alert. Well, it does give the Russians a very, very significant capability. That's why when the military says there's no thing as such thing as a militarily significant violation, they're wrong. I didn't like the military significant thing to begin with, but even using those terms, it's a very weak argument. And we could be facing a real threat. They could have done things under this treaty. 
they could have extended the start verification procedures. Easy, extend it for five years, once you get the agreement, you say we're extending it for five years or until we get the new agreement. They didn't do that. They said they were gonna get a bridging agreement for verification. Senator Luger even passed legislation to enable that. They didn't do it. Now they come to the Senate and say, you must ratify START because it's so urgent. Well, if it was so urgent, why didn't you extend START until you had this done? And why didn't you get a bridging agreement? Why didn't you pursue an executive agreement to try to get the verification measures and provisions? Verification measures are not just telemetry, it's not just NTM, it's not just on-site inspection. It's the construction of the treaty. It's location restrictions, movement notifications, all of the things that were there in, in START. And I didn't even think the original START treaty was all that verifiable. Okay, INF, I'm a big fan. But it was pretty darn good. So, there you go. Uh, great, uh, thanks for those great answers. Um, now, I'm gonna ask two questions for each of the panelists and then it will be thrown down uh, to the audience. So, I wanted to ask uh, Ms. Dr. Halperin to talk about this argument for about Russia relations. Uh, it seems like one of the main arguments that have been made recently is that Russia is cooperating more, for example, in Afghanistan in the north uh, for supply lines into the country. It seems like there's kind of two worlds. One is that Russia wants to cooperate because they don't want an unstable Central Asia where they have a lot of interests. Uh, and so they're gonna cooperate no matter what. Another world is that Russia will only cooperate with us if we politically do what they want. In that instance, that's the START Treaty. Uh, why do you think that would, do you think they're not gonna cooperate with us if we don't sign the START Treaty? And if not, why wouldn't they just stop cooperating when they disagree on things like missile defense in NATO? Well, they didn't, they've cooperated more since we had the reset of our relationship than they cooperated before. Um, so I think it's always the case uh, that countries will do what they conceive to be in their interests, uh, but their interests are complicated and it depends somewhat on what, uh, what we are offering them in terms of a relationship. I think the Russians clearly wanted a new strategic arms limitation treaty, which was legally binding and which had effective verification procedures in it, something the Bush administration had denied them. Uh, and I think the administration position was, we will do that if the treaty is in our interest. And I think it negotiated a treaty that was in its interest, and that provided a framework, including the general political, quote, reset of the relationship, which in fact has led to greater Russian cooperation in Afghanistan. They are now allowing the supply routes, which they weren't before, they are now cooperating more in Iran than before. That does not mean we should accept a treaty which is not in our interest, uh, but it means that it is an added advantage for a treaty which is in our interest. And I think this treaty clearly is in the interests of the United States, and it gets us this added advantage of greater Russian willingness to cooperate with us. Okay, uh, my second question is about the political process of START. Um, there seems to be a lot of Republican calls to not pass START in the lame duck session, but not too many calls that they won't pass it at all. Uh, what is your problem with pushing START into the 112th Congress uh, in January? Well, I haven't actually said anything about that. Uh, I think the question is, uh, what is the reason for the delay? Um, and I haven't seen anything other than the statement that there's not enough time that the thing was rushed. In fact, there were a very large number of hearings. There were all these statistics in their committee report about the number of days compared to the number of days on other treaties. Uh, there was a request to see the negotiating record, which was met. There were a number of questions presented to the administration. My understanding is all the questions have been answered. There are no outstanding questions. And so the issue is, what is the reason not to bring up the treaty? Uh, the hearings have been completed, the questions have been answered, uh, the materials that senators have asked to see have all been provided to them. It isn't clear to me what they would do uh, 
uh, with the additional time. Uh, now, there is a question of the appropriate amount of floor time uh, for, for a treaty. Uh, and Senator Kyle suggested if we had two weeks, he thought that would be enough. I would hope Senator Reid could find two weeks. I don't think that's an unreasonable amount of time to spend debating a treaty uh, on the floor. So I would turn around and say, this Congress has done all this work. If it's not passed in the next month, it will have to start all over again in the next Congress. I see no reason to wait unless there's some specific reason to do so. And just a cry that, quote, it's being rushed, I find not persuasive. Thanks. Uh, and to the negative debater, uh, one thing that you've talked a lot about is verification. And one thing that you've written uh, was that the worst case for really a treaty is if it has a low degree of verifiability and there is a difficult, and you then don't have the ability to deny the benefits of cheating. Um, my question is, why would the U.S. not be able to deny the benefits of cheating with 1,550 warheads and 700 delivery vehicles allowed under the treaty? First, one of the things that I, I, it is true that one of, all right, let me step back a second. Um, when we have evaluated what is effective verification and how we should conduct that assessment, one of the things is the, the first step is the degree of verifiability. And that has to do with our ability to monitor activities of concern measured against those limits in the agreement. Next, we take the degree of verifiability. And when I say we, I mean going back to 1985 or so. Um, I didn't mean to say what year I started working on these, so erase that from your memory. Um, but after that, you take that, that more technical assessment and you work it into the broader political assessment, which includes what is the, the party's history of compliance. That makes perfect sense. If you're verifying an agreement with Britain, you're probably going to have you know, more confidence on any given agreement than if you're going to be verifying an agreement with the North Koreans or the Iranians or the Russians who have, who have violated virtually, I think, every agreement we've ever had with them. Um, one of the things about denying the benefits of cheating for Russia, the administration has said we'll, we'll increase our alert levels. The problem is that assumes that we're, we're flashing back 20 or 40 years to a world in which the only enemy the United States confronted was the Soviet Union. We're not merely worried about deterring the former Soviet Union. We're concerned about deterring North Korea and China and Russia and all of these other states and even to the degree that we need to be able to deter non-state actors. And so I think we, we can take it from that and then we can also say what has been our, our ability to bring the Russians back into compliance. Um, we've had some successes with the former Soviet Union, but we've also had many cases in which we have not been able to bring Russia back into compliance with their arms control obligations or to work co cooperatively with us, even on a private basis to try to alleviate our concerns, to open ourselves up so that if they had concerns, they could do that. So I think we are, in this agreement, we are faced with a low degree of verifiability, unfortunately. And we also then are faced with a party that has a very poor compliance record and whose history of resolving our compliance concerns is not good. Uh, okay, thanks. Uh, my second question kind of has to do with why we ratify the treaty or not. Uh, for the treaty, there seems to be three kind of clear arguments, strategic stability, relations with Russia, 
and nonproliferation, which hasn't really been made in this debate. Uh, your arguments seem to be a, a, a large set of problems with the verification regime uh, for this treaty. Why do you think that adds up to a reason to reject the treaty altogether? And why would we be better in that world of no verification? Thank you. I, I believe that one of the reasons that we've always said we are going to pursue verification is that we believe that an agreement that we can effectively verify and get early detection and go to that country um, to try to resolve problems is going to contribute more to stability. Um, the problem with New Start is that the Russians could, even without violating the agreement in any overt way, so increase their strategic forces that if you put a breakout or a violation on top of that, you're, you're not contributing to stability. Um, I think our relations with Russia can stand or fall on their own. Um, we have many areas of common interest. The, the cooperation on nuclear terrorism was going on well before we even started our negotiations during the Bush administration with Russia on, on a post-start agreement. And I think the reason that the proliferation agreement, uh, the proliferation implications haven't come up is because I think in people's heart of hearts, they know darn well that whether or not this treaty is ratified will have little to no positive impact on North Korea's decisions to pursue their nuclear weapons capability, nor Iran's. And in fact, to the degree that that the United States and its ability to defend itself and to modernize its strategic systems is limited, they would be encouraged to exacerbate their proliferation. So that, I think that's why you probably haven't heard much. Great. Uh, we're now going to turn this to the audience. Uh, does anyone have any questions? Uh, great. Uh, man in the second row in the middle. Hi, thank you. <clears throat> My name is Howard Moreland. Um, it, it just doesn't seem to me that the merits of this thing are, are figuring very much into what's happening at all. When I saw Kyle on TV, Senator Kyle, explaining that uh, he was against voting on the treaty, it seemed to me he was, he was uh, displaying the joy of a child who's gotten a Christmas present early. That, uh, I mean, Republicans generally are opposed to treaties um, they've got enough Republican senators to uh, sustain a filibuster, and if they uh, postpone it until the next term starts, they've got enough senators to kill the treaty. Um, why would they? Uh, why would they vote for it? I mean, it's uh, it's sort of Republican ideology to oppose treaties, isn't it? Okay. First, let me tell you that I was Senator Kyle's liaison on the Senate Intel Committee for four and a half years. And in that entire time, I have never seen Senator Kyle act like a child waiting for Christmas. Smiling, not even that often. Um, Okay, it may have had to do with the trip we took where I packed him into a little bitty plane and made him sleep on it. Okay. But no, it is certainly true, certainly true, that Republicans are far more skeptical and far more um, critical in their evaluation of arms control agreements as a tool of achieving US national security or international stability. That is true. I don't know for how long that really has been true, but I know that in the Bush administration, a part of the perspective was it is a tool. It is a tool that should be evaluated according to which it can achieve our goals. And when it can't, 
which in many cases it can't, we need to be finding those other tools. And if we take a tool like an arms control agreement and pretend like it is going to solve our national security problems, we will not be seeking with the energy and resolve and persistence those tools that may indeed contribute to national security. And I, I would offer up, you know, I, I do think, I wish Proliferation Security Initiative had more achievements lately. I think res, UN Resolution 1540, which calls on nations to control what is going on in their territory and sets up a regime to help countries do that. I think, and, and with Biological Weapons Convention, um, the interim uh, procedures that people explored where they were looking at, you know, instead of pretending like we're verifying the BWC when we all know we're not, why don't we talk about what is the proper code of conduct for scientists? What are the things that we can all do to explore this problem and come up with creative solutions? I think, um, for me, it is that Republicans are looking to what are, what are the creative things that we can come up with that are new and that aren't these ancient tools of the 1960s and 70s. But I know that if, you're, if you've worked on nothing but the tools of the 60s and 70s, arms control, it, it is hurtful. And, and that creates some animosity and it creates tension in this debate that I think won't be over with for another 10 or 15 years. Thank you, Mary. Uh, actually, it's not true that Republicans uh, have an ideological objection to arms control treaties. Most of the arms control treaties adopted by the Senate were adopted by overwhelming votes. I think one or two unanimously, most of the others with, uh, with 90 votes for them. Uh, there is an ideological dispute about the test ban treaty, but apart from that, um, there has been enormous bipartisan support as reflected in the fact that the people who were in the previous Republican administrations until the last one are almost entirely in favor of this treaty and they come out uh, for the treaty. You have a very large bipartisan group of people who have come out for the treaty. I agree that we should not be in favor of treaties for their own sake, that we have to ask the question, for each security threat, what is the right approach? And in some cases, it may be an arms control treaty, and in other cases, uh, it may be a different kind of agreement. What I frankly expected when this treaty was negotiated is that the criticism of it would be that it is a binding legal treaty with verification measures in it, uh, and that the alternative that would be presented was the pres position that the Bush administration took, which is that we wanted a treaty with no verification measures, uh, with very ill-defined limits, uh, and which was simply a political document which said, we and the Russians are no longer enemies of each other. Uh, for example, of the view, a lot of this comes down to the question of how do we see the Russians? We don't see them as we used to see them during the Cold War. Uh, that was the view of the previous administration. It was no longer said to be a threat from Russia, and we didn't pose a threat to them, and therefore we didn't need an arms, strategic arms control agreement. We just needed this very general political agreement whose provisions kicked in only 10 minutes before the treaty expired, and which had no verification provisions in it. But that has not been the criticism of this treaty. It has not been to say we really prefer that alternative. It has been to focus on specific aspects of the treaty uh, that people object to. I'm allowed to say something briefly. I, it, when the Moscow Treaty was negotiated and signed, um, it was certainly true that we saw the former Soviet Union in a different way than we had during the start years. Um, I think that was fair. I was the one that wrote the non-compliance report about the Biological Weapons Convention that said, Okay, they've said they're gonna give up their biological weapons. It, it was a massive program, we need to give them more time when we couldn't verify that they had eliminated it. The Moscow Treaty was a part of that. Remember the non Luger provisions that provide for the United States to go in and eliminate uh, so many former 
uh, Soviet Union systems. The Moscow Treaty was a part of that. We believed it. Um, I did ask the folks that worked for me to pay special attention as we were reviewing noncompliance to whether or not we could view the noncompliance history across the board as an early indicator of concern about where Russia was going. Um, and I must say that it took a lot, uh, it, it has to do with, with belief and hope and thinking that things have changed. Um, but I must say that my conversations with my counterpart about the Biological Weapons Convention, our, our discussions with them about the, the Chemical Weapons Convention and their refusal to give us a, a good set of data on their, their original stockpiles. And then you add what they did with the Conventional Forces in Europe Treaty. And then you see how they were treating, began treating their neighbors. Um, there, were, there were many, many indications um, over time, Putin's speech at Munich, that, that were giving us cause for concern. And I think it was not until the last year of the Bush administration where there was a, a firm consensus at the deputies committee level that the, the Russia that we thought we were dealing with in the Moscow, Moscow Treaty was no longer there. You can say, okay, that's stupid, but we were watching, we were, we were paying attention, but we were hopeful, and hope is a hard thing to kill. Uh, yes, in the third row. Um, Bartosz Wisniewski from the Polish Institute of International Affairs. Firstly, I'd like to thank both Madam De Sutter and Dr. Halperin for mapping this uh, internal U.S. debate. And I've, the question, I would like to take it out of the box and, and in, into Central Europe. Um, the question is, what is your reading of the voices of support for the START Treaty coming from Central Europe? Um, and the second part of the question is, what role, if any, could or, or does this, this, these, do these voices of support play for your uh, internal U.S. debate. Thank you. Well, I think it's clear that uh, most of the governments, if not all the governments of Central Europe and many private citizens there, uh, strongly favor the ratification of the START Treaty. I think at the very least, uh, we should not argue that a reason to be against the treaty is that it somehow unsettles our European allies. I think that they all welcome the treaty and would like to see it ratified. That is not by itself sufficient grounds to decide to ratify, but it certainly means uh, that it is out of bounds to say we should not ratify this treaty because it will upset people in Central Europe. I see no evidence of that. On the back row. Mike Wheeler, uh, Institute for Defense Analyses. The stability metric was brought up fairly late in the debate, and my question to both panelists is basically this. If it is true that we don't have verification in place to keep them from doing some very quick breakout that we don't detect, does that, in fact, destabilize? I mean, is first strike an effective strategy that they then would have that they wouldn't have had before? given the force structure that we have. Secondly, if the issue is arms race instability, uh, does the absence or presence of the treaty make a difference in terms of what is going to happen in terms of verification that we have in it for what they could do in an arms race? And thirdly, are the classic crisis first strike stability, arms race stability metrics that we developed in the Cold War for the basically bipolar confrontation the appropriate metrics that we should be applying to the relationship as we think of the broader nuclear security the dilemma that we have today. Mr. Wheeler, hello. Um, I would say that one of the things that the U.S. has going for it in the absence of a treaty is that 
while for those of us here in the U.S., we view ourselves as quite predictable, our debates are in the open, our fights are long and difficult. Um, but one viewing the United States from overseas can be concerned about awakening the giant, about if I overstep, perhaps I will so concern the U.S. that they will <laughs> undertake modernization or buildup. Um, I think that it, going back four or five years, I mean, I was in a debate at uh, Carnegie, and my the Russian member on the panel was very concerned about the absence of a strategic agreement with the U.S. They want to have strategic agreements with the U.S., but in this case, um, now, the Bush administration could have extended the START Treaty for five years and left it to the Obama administration to figure out, you know, get an agreement to, to move out. We didn't do that, but we knew that they had that option. Um, what, what happens is that if you negotiate with the Russians against a deadline on something that you have expressed as being one of your highest national security priorities, they are good negotiators. They're very smart. They're going to take advantage of it, and they did. And they got multiple benefits across the board in this treaty. And the administration has sought to deny that there are ambiguities left. Those ambiguities are there. And those ambiguities are going to come to bite us back. And that will not be stabilizing. So I do believe that they can go back and fix those. I don't think that in the absence of the treaty, there would necessarily be an arms race. I think in the absence or with the treaty, the Russian Federation has made a decision to increase their strategic forces, to modernize them, to modernize their, their nuclear weapons on them. And I think the United States has simply been ignoring the potential threat that that poses, and we need to address it. Um, I think first strike metrics are probably not the only thing that you should consider, but yes. I think in your calculations about where are the Russians going to be in terms of deterrence, in terms of political um, give and take, in terms of everything else, if they can say to us quietly, in a diplomatic situation, we have a first strike capability where we can eliminate or significantly reduce your second strike capability, that matters. Not everybody may agree with me, but I think that that's still out there and I think that that's still how the Russian Federation thinks, especially their military forces. I certainly think that matters, but I think it is a fantasy world to believe that there is a serious Russian threat of developing an effective first strike capability against the United States. Uh, even the Bush administration maintained adequate modernization to avoid that risk, and certainly the current administration uh, will continue to do that. We have a force uh, which is tested against the standard that it can survive a Russian surprise attack and destroy an overwhelmingly large number of targets within Russia, far beyond, in my view, the number that would be necessary uh, to uh, deter them. The Russians, I think, are much more worried about our first strike capability. And the notion that they would come to us and say, watch out, we have a first strike capability, I think if they did that, they would believe that we would preempt and that they would be much more worried about uh, the preemption. Uh, we maintain and will continue to maintain, with or without the treaty, forces uh, that are large enough to re remove any conceivable doubt in anyone's mind that we have a f sufficient uh, deterrent. You can argue, as the Bush administration did, that it's the wrong calculation. Uh, that, uh, and I would argue that that, that that insight was correct. 
What was incorrect was the belief that Russia had somehow turned into a war-abiding, peaceful, democratic, maybe even Christian country. Uh, but, but that's a separate question in my view. I mean, one reason to think you don't have to worry about the Russian strategic forces is that you think they've turned to being peaceful uh, allies of the United States. Another reason is to say that the United States and Russia, while they have conflicting interests, do not have the kinds of conflicts that would lead either side to contemplate a first strike with nuclear weapons. And that, therefore, we ought to be thinking about a very different world. Indeed, my view is, if there's a serious criticism of this treaty, it is that it accepts the framework of the Cold War and the framework of strategic stability based on the threat of a first strike. It deals with that question very well, um, but it doesn't uh, deal, in my view, with the real problems of the real world. Uh, incidentally, I think the way the United States would respond if it decided the Russians were breaking out of the treaty in the quickest way is to upload additional warheads on each one of its of its missiles, and it could do that in very large numbers very quickly, uh, and that would be uh, uh, the first, rather than trying to f further alert the weapons, I don't even know how you do that with the missiles, uh, would be the response, and it would be a very large response, and it's one that I think the Russians, uh, the Russians are in fact uh, concerned about. We have uh, one more question. Uh, can you get on the far side? Nick Roth with the Union of Concerned Scientists. My question is for Mr. Sutter. Um, really, this was touched on a little bit before, but really everywhere else, uh, everywhere other than the Senate, this treaty has overwhelming bipartisan support from former secretaries of defense, former secretaries of state, the current military establishment, that many of which that were appointed under the Bush administration. So is it, in your opinion, that these people are all misguided. Are they? Are, are some withholding information? What, uh, what makes you think that all of these people are wrong? Well, I think that for for many of the members that have signed on to the START Treaty, their their rationales differ. In some cases, I think Secretary Schlesinger. I think he gets a three for count. Um, I think his view was um, having negotiated it, we're better off signing it than not. I mean, a lot of these folks believe that, you know, generally speaking, it's good to have strategic arms control agreements with the Russians. Um, I, am, I am modest in many ways, but when it comes to verification, not very. And when it comes to verification, I think that I am more right than they. Maybe one more question. No. Uh, at this point, we're going to shift to closing remarks. And each of the debaters are going to get three minutes to wrap up their arguments. And I will knock on the table two minutes just to let you know where you are in your speech. What's, the, what's that then? Is that five minutes? That's why we can't use this. That. This was 10. Oh. Yeah. See, you guys need to have multiple little ones. Yeah. Uh, and in uh, debate practice, what happens is the first speaker speaks last because they have the burden of convincing you that they are correct. So in this debate, um, Mr. Uh, Dr. Halperin will give a three-minute speech now. Okay, that's cool. It's only counting seconds. Oh. He has an iPad, and he's programming it with great big a great big clock. Right. So, like, when you get I I by the way started in this business in 1960, and I'm happy to identify the time of that. Um, and so, I need big clocks in order to see uh, what what time it is. Um, I think that. Uh, <coughs> We've spent an evening debating what's wrong or right with this treaty, and I have not heard anything that persuades me that there's a serious flaw or any reason why the Senate should not ratify the treaty. Um, the possibilities of Russian cheating would lead to increases in the Russian strategic posture. 
which would not in any way threaten strategic stability, threaten the United States' ability to defend its allies, threaten our ability to use extended deterrence, and uh, to deal with any conceivable threat to our security interests and those are our allies. And all of the discussion about possible cheating and whether we could be counted 3 percent or 10 percent every year simply uh, doesn't get to the heart of the question of how many additional warheads do you think the Russians could deploy before we would reliably detect it and be able to respond to it in a timely fashion. Uh, I believe that answer is far in excess of the amount of cheating that the Russians could have any hope of getting away with. Moreover, it is hard to imagine, in my view, any Russian strategic objective which would lead them to want to contemplate this world. After all, the Russians want this treaty. Uh, they believe correctly, in my view, that it is in their strategic interest and therefore that they can and will abide by it. It doesn't mean they won't cheat around the margins. It won't mean we have a serious disagreement about ballistic missile defense. We do have a serious disagreement uh, about um, <coughs> ballistic missile defense, but it is one that we found a way to deal with within the contours of the treaty. The Russians understand uh, that we reserve the right to develop uh, ballistic missile defense against other countries, and I think we understand that if we built a very large ballistic missile defense system uh, against Russia, while it would not violate the treaty, it would lead them to withdraw from the treaty. And we will have to continue to decide down the road whether we want to move in that direction. I think the fact is that technologically we cannot build such a system. I think a majority in both houses of the Congress understand that and will continue to understand that, so that that is not a real option and therefore uh, it is not something that will impede the ongoing effectiveness uh, of the treaty. I think we need to move on. My regret is that the treaty is very modest, that it has produced an enormous debate and one that will make it much harder to move forward with the kind of future agreements that I think we need to reduce the real risks of the use of nuclear weapons. Thank you. Thanks. And now, Paula Decider will close us out. And I get more help runs four minutes and 46 seconds, which I could read from my side. Okay. The way I'd like to close is in following this debate over the past few months, I've been struck by the contradictions um, that I've heard in the proponents' arguments. And I'll, I'll walk through a few of those. But first, I want to thank CSIS for inviting me to come here. I want to thank Clark Murdoch and Kevin. And I, this has been um, fun for somebody that is as much of a geek as I am. And I am impressed at this audience, their knowledge and their willingness to be out on a Tuesday night when it's raining to, to listen. So first, proponents have argued that it is urgent to get inspections in place, but that it wasn't deemed urgent enough to extend start or to get a bridging agreement, which the administration had promised from the White House. Um, we've heard that we need new start to thwart the Russian threat, but that there is no Russian threat, especially because of reset, but that we need new start to constrain their strategic forces. We've heard that we have to have new start because without verification, we won't have a handle on Russian strategic buildups and that even though we're not very worried about a Russian strategic buildup, that we, that we didn't really need the start verification regime that was so cumbersome, including attribution, location and movement restrictions and a ban on telemetry that would give us better compliance. We've heard that they won't cheat, but if they do cheat, it doesn't matter. We've heard that we can adequately respond to a Russian breakout of New START, but in the absence of New START, we would have to assume the worst and devote significant resources to, to strategic modernization that would put our troops in Iraq and Afghanistan at risk. We've heard that any ambiguities that existed in the treaty were cleared up by the resolution of ratification, but we've also heard at the same time that there were no problems or ambiguities. 
we've had it acknowledged that Russia cheated on START provisions, but that that was just a matter of treaty interpretation. The Russian unilateral statement threatening to withdraw if the U.S. increases its missile defense capabilities doesn't matter, nor do Russian disagreements with a resolution of ratification. Those are just matters of treaty interpretation. NTM will be a significant part of monitoring, but we don't need to increase funding for it, but we do need inspections so that we don't have to divert NTM from more important targets that we don't really need to monitor all that much because we don't anticipate a Russian threat. Russia and the U.S. are partners, but they will screw us on Iran and Afghanistan if we don't ratify the treaty. The New START Treaty has no impact on U.S. missile defenses, conventional global strike, and rail mobile missiles are clearly covered. But the Russian view that it does constrain missile defenses and clo conventional global strike and doesn't cover rail mobile missiles doesn't matter. Republican senators who have no experience and don't really understand these important issues are opposing New START because they are ill-informed, don't want the Obama administration to have foreign policy successes, or are just ignorant. But there are no substantive disagreements on New START. Despite the fact that there are no substantive disagreements, we cannot possibly wait until the new Congress for a debate and a vote because substantive disagreements might arise. Unlike old START, which had attribution, under new START, we're going to count every warhead on every Russian missile and bomber, but the annual inspection quota means we'll only be inspecting two to three percent of the Russian forces, and regardless of how many warheads they carry on their bombers, each bomber only counts as one warhead. We have to have verification tools, and we have new ones, reenter vehicle on-site inspection and unique identifiers. We didn't even talk about that. While the RVOSI procedures are identical to those in Old START, unique identifiers are new. The problem is that the unique identifiers aren't unique, and non-deployed missiles are, in any case, unlikely to be co-located at inspection sites, and so that, but that doesn't matter because these are significant improvements in verification. Critics, including Senator Bond, the Vice Chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, or Intelligence Committee, is simply wrong when he says New START isn't adequately verifiable because the administration has said several times that it is effectively verifiable. Finally, New START will increase stability even though it is structured to encourage Russian merving, which is destabilizing. So I think those who are adamant supporters of an agreement with Russia, um, any agreement will be able to continue to support this. I hope that as a result of this, you will at least hear the critique of START coming from those in, in the public debate and those senators who are bold enough to stand up to it as having significant concerns that are valid. And at least listen to them, disagree with them, but at least listen to those critiques. And understand that these kinds of debates are not something that the general public enjoys, nor should they, but they are something that matters because these agreements are the, the supreme law of the land and will bind the United States for at least 10 years in terms of our ability to structure our national security approaches to the future. So I thank you so much. Thanks everyone for coming and let's give the debaters a round of hand. At this applause. point, we would usually have a memento of this debate to give to each of the debaters, but it's caught somewhere in the transportation system of a semi-public organization, and we'll have to send them to them instead. But again, I want to echo Kevin, great job. Thanks so much for coming.